Israel says it will step up its raids against Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Israeli forces have killed dozens of Palestinians this year, but is diplomacy enough? What needs to be done to stop the bloodshed? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. For months now, Israeli forces have been conducting nightly raids across the occupied West Bank. This has led to repeated confrontations and the deaths of more than 45 Palestinians and at least 11 Israelis so far this year. Israel says the military raids are meant to stop attacks against Israelis, but Palestinians view it as another example of its violent occupation. And on Sunday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced his government will step up those nightly raids. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Sarah Khairat in West Jerusalem. Dawn raids is how they've been operating recently. Israeli forces move in fast while Palestinians sleep. In the last few weeks, this has become a daily routine in occupied East Jerusalem and the rest of the occupied West Bank. This time, they're sealing the family home of Palestinian Hassan Karaka. On Friday, the father of three slammed his car into a bus stop near the illegal settlement of Ramot. Three Israelis were killed, including two sibling children. On Sunday, the weekly cabinet meeting turned its attention to the frequency of these attacks, three in just two weeks. All carried out by young Palestinians, including a 13-year-old, all from occupied East Jerusalem and all operating alone. And so the new Israeli government wants to send a strong message. The appropriate answer to terror is to strike hard and further deepen our roots in our country. Accordingly, the cabinet is meeting today to prepare for an even broader action against those carrying out terrorism and their supporters in East Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, while preventing as much as possible harming those uninvolved. But family and friends of the attackers say they too are being targeted in what they've described as collective punishment through mass arrests, raids and demolitions of homes. Dozens of Palestinians have already been killed by Israeli forces this year alone. Israel's most right-wing government hasn't been in power for long, but it's already facing major hurdles. Apart from the Palestinian issue, it's also facing accusations of trying to undermine the judiciary and move the country away from democracy. Saturday saw the biggest nationwide anti-government protest in weeks. More than 145,000 people stood in cold weather ahead of the first of several Knesset votes to curb judiciary powers. Some have called for an end to Israel's ruling coalition, which has far-right ultra-nationalist parties, including ministers with convictions ranging from racism to the prime minister himself, who's on trial for corruption. But Benjamin Netanyahu has dismissed these protests as a refusal to accept the last election results. Sarah Khairat, Al Jazeera, West Jerusalem. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in West Jerusalem last month where he called for urgent steps to restore calm between the two sides. We continue to believe that the best way to achieve it is through preserving and then realizing the vision of two states. As I said to the Prime Minister, anything that moves us away from that vision is, in our judgment, detrimental to Israel's long-term security and its long-term identity as a Jewish and democratic state. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. They're all joining us from the U.S. In Washington, D.C., David Pollack, senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's a former senior advisor to the broader Middle East and the State Department. In Brooklyn, New York, Beth Miller, a political director at the Jewish Voice for Peace Action. And in Arlington, Virginia, Khaled El-Gindi, a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. He's the author of Blindspot, America and the Palestinians, From Balfour to Trump. 
a warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. David, let me start with you today. During his visit to Israel in the occupied West Bank last month, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken discussed the importance of a two-state solution with top Israeli and Palestinian officials. Of course, this is nothing new. We hear this rhetoric from U.S. administrations all the time. Many analysts have said that the Biden administration doesn't really want to engage in this conflict any longer. What would the U.S. have to do in order to actually move the needle on this front? Well, the U.S. obviously does want to engage with this conflict, and Secretary Blinken's visit was one sign of that, along with the visits in the same week of National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and CIA Director Bill Burns. So I would start by taking strong issue with the idea that the Biden administration has given up on this conflict or, for some reason, doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Uh, the second point, to answer your question more directly, what the U.S. would have to do, I think, is to continue to work with both sides, with all sides, actually, including outside Arab partners, to defuse tensions rather than aggravate them by actions that any side would take, including incendiary rhetoric or attempts to change the status quo in some fundamental way while efforts continue at lower levels to reach conditions that would allow for political progress on this issue. Khaled, let me get your take on this. Uh, the U.S. government continues to reiterate the importance of a two-state solution. From your point of view, is this anything that is in any way realistic at this point? Because there are a lot of people out there that believe that the two-state solution is essentially dead and that there's really no way to revive it. What's your take? I think the short answer is, uh, is no. Uh, I think going back to the initial question about uh, the administration and its level of seriousness, I think it's pretty clear that this administration does not want to engage in this issue uh, on the Palestinian front. Um, certainly, it has a very deep uh, relationship with Israel and is, you know, uh, engagement with Israel is at extraordinarily high levels. Um, I think the, the three visits that we saw from senior U.S. officials in the last couple of weeks uh, were pre-planned. Um, they were not in response to uh, the violence on the ground. Um, they had, they were already planned. And I think when the administration talks about a two-state solution, uh, when you have a government in Israel that is literally committed to dismantling a two-state solution from uh, including the Palestinian Authority in some cases, a number of ministers um, have expressed a desire to dismantle the Palestinian Authority itself. Um, you have Kahanists uh, in the government uh, who are uh, extreme on, on many levels, um, but who openly favor annexation in the West Bank. Um, this is the most right-wing government in Israel's history. Uh, I think it's it's uh, sort of bizarre to talk about a two-state solution, uh, not only because you have this extreme government in place that is doing its utmost to destroy a two-state solution, um, but, but also because of the violence on the ground. I mean, it's a little bit like standing in front of a burning building and saying, um, I wholly support uh, fire safety and uh, smoke alarms. Uh, Beth, um I saw you nodding along uh, to some of what uh, Khalid was saying. It looked like you wanted to jump in, so uh, go ahead. I I agree with what Khalid is saying. I think that um, it's simply true that what the Biden administration has been saying about what it wants in terms of a two-state solution uh, simply just doesn't match with what they're doing. And I think that Khalid is right. I think that when you look at the situation on the ground, when you listen to what Palestinians are saying about life under apartheid and occupation, it becomes pretty clear that the likelihood of a two-state solution, especially under this current government, but not only under this current government, um, looks dead. It's hard to imagine how that could really come forward. And I think specifically, the thing that we should also focus on and highlight is the hypocrisy of the Biden administration in that they continue to say that this is what they want, this is all they care about, this is what they're pushing for, a two-state solution, a two-state solution. But their actions don't lead us there. It's the status quo right now that they are trying to maintain is a horrible, violent status quo. 
That's the reality of life for Palestinians living under Israeli apartheid. Uh, for Palestinians, even just the last month, uh, over 40 Palestinians have been killed by Israelis. And it's only the beginning of February. And this is coming on the tail end of last year, which was under a different government that was not Israel's most extreme government in history, and in fact was supposed to be a more liberal government, when in fact we know that was not really the case, uh, that created the deadliest year for Palestinians since uh, the early 2000s. And so I think that we have to reckon with reality when we're talking about mm -hmm. what's actually possible move forward. Beth, let me let me just follow up with you on one point. Uh, you know, talking about the Biden administration uh, is is one thing. Um, but I want to ask you more specifically about where things stand when it comes to U.S. lawmakers on this issue, particularly Congress. I mean, uh, from your vantage point, do representatives, uh, do senators want the administration to do more to try to resolve this conflict? Is there political willpower on this front? It's a great question. I think that what we're seeing right now at the beginning of the 118th Congress, which was sworn in right around the time that this new extremist far-right Israeli coalition government came into power, we are seeing that there are cracks, right, in the kind of traditional bipartisan, we stand with Israel no matter what consensus. And you see some senators like um, Senator Van Hollen, or you see members of the House who are speaking out more and more and starting to say that they are deeply concerned by the actions of the Israeli government. However, uh, what we need to do is move past the point of deep concern. It's really good to see more and more members of Congress who are speaking out and saying that uh, they are worried about what could come down the line from this new government. However, what we really need are for members of Congress to realize that what is already happening right now is already too late. It is already too much. And we need not just statements of deep concern, but action. And actually, Senator Van Hollen, who I mentioned before, is an example of someone who is moving forward on things like pushing for an investigation of the killing of uh, Palestinian-American journalist Shulareen Abu Akleh. Or you have members of the House, like Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, for example, um, Representative AOC, Ayanna Pressley, Cori Bush, other progressive House members who are increasingly willing to speak out and say that we need actual concrete action, meaning restrictions on U.S. funding, conditions on U.S. funding, cutting. That's what we really need to be pushing for, our actions. Mm. And while the political work is smaller than it should be, it's growing quickly and I think will continue to grow the more the current Israeli government is being extreme in its policies. David, I want to take a step back for a moment and look look at some of the other things that are that are currently going on. You know, Israel's far right cabinet they've approved the legalization of nine illegal settler outposts in the occupied West Bank. Uh, there was a statement from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office that said more housing units are likely to be built in separate existing illegal settlements. The Biden administration opposes the authorization of Israeli outposts. They've aired their views against new settlements. I mean, the U.S. provides billions of dollars in military aid to Israel. Does the U.S. government not care? Do they not get offended by the fact that Israel essentially ignores them on this issue? The question uh, is actually misguided, because this is a conflict between two sides, not just one side. And you could ask a similar question about why the administration, quote unquote, ignores the fact that the Palestinian Authority continues to subsidize terrorism against innocent Israeli civilians. You could ask why the Biden administration, quote unquote, ignores the fact that senior members of the Palestinian Authority cabinet and senior members of the Fatah organization, of which Mahmoud Abbas, the PA president, is the chair, why they continue to call for the dismantling, not just of occupation, but of Israel. So the fact is that the Biden administration, like every American government and every reasonable person, is caught between two sides, each one of which has extremists that call for the political suicide of the other side, the Palestinians and the Israelis. And so, we need to ask what it is that can be done to get out of this impasse, rather than point fingers only at one side in this conflict. Khaled, Israel says the military raids across the occupied West Bank are meant to stop attacks against Israelis. Palestinians view this as another example of its violent occupation. 
Prime Minister Netanyahu announced that his government is going to step up those nightly raids. How concerned are you that this situation is only going to get worse? And what are the implications of that? Yeah, I mean, I think all the trend lines are certainly very uh, disturbing. Uh, everything looks like it's getting worse. Um, you know, we've, we've heard, we've seen how uh, the casualty figures, uh, the, 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 the deaths, especially of Palestinians, um, but also of Israelis, is much higher this year, and we're only in February uh, than it was last year. So uh, uh, everything is moving. All the trend lines are negative uh, in terms of uh, people's rights on the ground, in terms of basic safety and security, and in terms of any political outlook remotely resembling a two-state solution. Um, on this question of both sides, though, I think we have to bear in mind that there is no parity between the two sides. Um, Israel is an occupying power. Israel is the fifth most powerful military in the world, and it is enforcing its occupation through violence. Uh, uh, occupation is, by definition, violent and coercive. It can only be sustained by force of arms. And so when we see these Israeli raids, that's precisely what these, Israel, these uh, daily army raids are about. They're about enforcing a military occupation over a subjugated population um, that has been living under martial law for 55 years. Uh, and occasionally, there are bouts of resistance. Sometimes that resistance is violent, uh, and sometimes it's not. Um, but it's always predictable. Uh, when you have uh, an occupation that has to use more and more violence in order to sustain itself. So the difference between uh, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side isn't just one of huge power asymmetry. We talked about extremists. Um, the difference is that the extremists are actually in the Israeli government. Mahmoud Abbas's government is uh, quite ineffective, quite weak. Um, but you will be hard-pressed to find a more moderate uh, set of, uh, of policies and individuals than those who currently uh, reside in, in Ramallah and rule over the Palestinian Authority. Um, so I, I think we have to bear in mind uh, these enormous differences. And so this is one of the key reasons that the administration doesn't want to engage, because it understands that engaging, pushing this process along, necessarily means putting pressure on Israel. And that is something for domestic political reasons mainly, but also for ideological reasons. Um, the Biden administration has zero interest in doing. Beth, uh, we heard Sarah Khaira's report earlier in the show. Uh, Sarah pointed out that you know, this is Israel's most right-wing government. Uh, it hasn't been in power for long, but that it's already facing a lot of hurdles, uh, not just about the Palestinian issue. It's also facing accusations of trying to undermine the judiciary, uh, accusations of steering the country away from democracy. What's all this going to mean going forward for the potential you know, attempts at resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and, and essentially for the government there? I think what's happening right now is that the mask is fully coming off. Israel has never been a democracy for all of the people that the government rules over. It has always been a country that is uh, upholding apartheid and that is uh, oppressing Palestinians and that has not been a democracy for all of the people who live under its government rule. This current coalition government has basically sped up the process of exposing that. And uh, it's terrifying and has meant increasing violence and will continue to mean increasing violence. Uh, what I think that means, though, what it should mean is that the international community, including in the U.S., should be responding in kind, right? If the Israeli government is being very clear about the fact that in in reality, there is not really democracy here and any vestiges of pieces of the government that were democratic for Jewish Israeli citizens, for example, are falling apart and coming away under kind of corruption and these attacks on, um, on those pieces of the government that were democratic. The U.S. government, for example, should be responding in kind. What you always hear, not just from the Biden administration, but from any past administration really here in the U.S., has been 
Israel is a democratic ally. Israel is our most dem important democratic ally, various versions of that. It is simply, it has never actually been true. And right now it is very blatantly not true. And so if this government continues down this path, this is the thing that when Secretary Blinken visited Israel, this was the only thing he really wanted to talk about. He wanted to talk about judiciary reforms, concerns basically that if Israel looked undemocratic, it would make it very difficult for the Biden administration to keep supporting it. It seems pretty clear to anyone paying attention that this government doesn't really care about that. And so if they continue down this path where they are increasingly exposing themselves and increasingly taking off the mask and showing that Israel is just a violent apartheid regime, in fact, and not a Democrat, a Democratic ally, um, then what should be happening is that countries should respond in, in kind. The Biden administration should respond to Israel as it would to a country that is undemocratic and violently oppressing the people who live under its rule. And that should mean using the pieces of leverage that it has that matter most. For example, the $3.8 billion in military funding that we send to that country every single year. David, if there is some way to, to revive talks, uh, whether it's talks about a potential two-state solution or, or some form of negotiation over trying to stop the bloodshed, how much of a role does the U.S. need to play in, in mediating this? Uh, and, and are there other international actors who, who can play a role? I think other international actors can and are playing a role. The question is, are they playing a constructive role or a destructive role? So people and countries that support Hamas, for example, which is pledged to destroy Israel by violent means and never to agree to peace or a two-state solution, those people are playing a destructive role. People who support negotiations between the two parties, and I find it ironic that someone who claims to represent an organization calling for peace and justice would only accuse one side of a conflict of any problems or violations or issues. People who want to play a constructive role from the outside, whether it's the U.S. government or countries in Europe or Arab countries, would try to get both sides, Israelis and Palestinians, whatever their governments and whatever their failings on both sides, to negotiate with each other and to defuse tensions rather than inflame them. So you do see some Arab governments playing that role in certain aspects of the conflict, so that Egypt, for example, has played a very important role in trying to restrain Hamas from firing missiles and rockets at innocent Israeli civilians on the other side of the border. Jordan has played a constructive role in trying to point out that actually the status quo on the Temple Mount, where Jordan is actively involved, is being maintained by both sides so far, and to warn against any attempts to infringe upon that and inflame tensions. And that's the kind of role mm. that I think I would be looking for, rather than people who hurl accusations at only one side or the other and think that somehow that is going to help resolve the conflict. Beth, it looked to me like you wanted to respond, so I'm going to give you a chance to do so right now. I think what we just heard is an incredibly oversimplistic idea of what peace actually entails and how we actually get to peace. Peace and justice go hand in hand. And these ideas of how we move forward cannot mean that you are simply erasing power dynamics entirely. That is not actually how things move forward or how we reach a just, sustainable future in which all people are living in equality and, and injustice. We cannot, Khaled mentioned this early, there are power differentials at play here. You cannot simply say there are two sides, there are many sides, and they all need to come together and talk. We've tried that before, and it led us to where we are now. The truth is there is one government mm. that holds all of the power, and that is the Israeli government, mm. and they are ruling over and oppressing Palestinians. And so I think it's important that we note that the accusations that are being hurled, for example, the idea that Israel is an apartheid government, are things that the overwhelming majority of the international human rights community are saying. 
This is not just some people here or there, some countries here or there. There are Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the United Nations. This is something that has been looked into, proven, investigated, not to mention the fact that Israeli human rights organizations are saying it about their own government. Mm. And Palestinians who have been living under it for decades are saying it as well. So um, I just want to note that, in fact, these are quite um, accepted ideas, mm. except for by countries like the United States, which refuse to acknowledge what the reality on the ground really is. One issue I wanted to get into a little bit is um, to ask you, you know, how big a problem right now is the disunity among Palestinian leadership? When you have leadership fractured between the Palestinian Authority and the occupied West Bank and Hamas and Gaza, I mean, what does that do when it comes to trying to resolve the situation? Well, obviously, it's it's very uh, destructive. I mean, the, the old adage about a house divided against itself cannot stand, I think, certainly applies in the case of the Palestinians. They've been deeply divided politically, geographically, uh, institutionally for uh, for for many years now. It's been uh, since 2007. Um, so that division has been absolutely debilitating. And, and has sapped this Palestinian leadership of uh, any ability to be effective either as a negotiator or as a governing power. Um, and has, it's, it's also sapped its legitimacy. And I think one of the reasons we're seeing this eruption of, of violence and this armed insurgency um, that is concentrated particularly in the Northern West Bank, but not exclusively, uh, is precisely because of the ineffective of both leaderships uh, in Ramallah and in Gaza. And so you see Palestinians who are saying um, Hamas's way of doing things isn't going to work. Um, Abbas's uh, approach of just sitting around waiting for the political and diplomatic stars to align perfectly in Israel and the international community uh, to restart negotiations, that's not going to happen either. Uh, and so uh, it's only when the occupation feels that it has to pay a price um, to maintaining the status quo, mm. um, that it will, uh, that things might change. And so that's precisely why we're seeing mm. uh, what is happening now uh, uh, on the ground. Um, and, and just to go back to, to Beth's point, we have to look, if you talk about peace, you have to look at the drivers of conflict and not simply put groups of people around a negotiating table mm. and say, talk to each other. Power asymmetry is one of the key factors that drives this conflict because you've got one power mm. that can impose its will on the ground without negotiations, whether it's through settlements or state violence, the army, uh, incursions, killings, mass arrests. Israel can do all of these things unilaterally. Mm. It has no need for negotiations. Um, and that is what drives conflict, because you have one side that can impose its will forcibly on the other side. So it's mm. meaningless to talk about uh, negotiations, I think, in this context. And, and everybody understands that. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, David Pollack, Beth Miller, and Khalid El-Gindi. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.